Hi, it's Miss Hall here, and this is the first revision lesson for the Conflict and Tension World War One GCSE module. Um, today we are going to be going right back to the beginning, and we are going to be looking at the four main long-term causes of the First World War. Um, by the end of this lesson, you should be able to identify what the four main long-term causes are. You should be able to explain how they led to the war, and you should also be able to give specific evidence for each one, including dates, individuals, place names, the names of events, and so on. Remember, for this GCSE paper in particular, you need to know the topic in a lot of depth. So the examiner really wants to know that you've done your research, you've done your revision and that you can give specific evidence, that you do remember dates, that you can make links. You need to know it in a lot of depth. So that's what we're going to be working on today. So what you'll need is you'll need um, preferably a two page spread or a double page spread in your exercise book or in a notebook. So you'll need like two sides of A4. If you've got a sheet of A3, that would be great too. Um, if you're just working on paper, then just two pieces of A4 paper will be fine as well. You're also going to need a pen and a ruler or something with a straight edge that you can draw lines with. So what we're going to do is um, I'm going to start off with the do it now as if we were in a lesson so that you can try and remember some things and retrieve information um, that you might already know. Uh, and then we're going to go through each one of the four main long term causes in detail and you are going to make a double page spread of notes. I'm going to show you how to do this in a way that's easy to revise so that you can use it later. You can make cue cards out of it. You can highlight it. Um, you can stick it on your wall. You can do whatever you want with it. Um, but hopefully it's going to allow you to make notes in a concise way and revise the information effectively. <clears throat> OK, so we're going to start off with the do it now. I'm just going to introduce the do it now to you, um, read out what you need to do. And then if you can pause this for three to five minutes to give yourself a chance to do it and then we will feed back afterwards. OK, so the task is, can you remember the four main long term causes of the First World War? I want you to write those down on your paper. So remember, main is an acronym. So each one of the letters in that word stand for something. So the M, the A, the I and the N all stand for something. I've given you some pictures there just in case you can't remember. They might jog your memory a little bit. Um, and then your stretching challenge is from memory. Can you identify a specific example or a specific piece of evidence for each one of these causes? So if you've identified what the A is, can you give me a specific example of that or specific evidence about that? OK, so pause this video now for three to five minutes just to give yourself a chance to do that and then start playing again once you are ready. OK, so hopefully you've had a chance to do that now. Um, we're just going to feed back on these. So I'm going to give you the answers and you can see if you've got it right or you can add anything that you might have missed. OK, so the M stands for militarism, and that is when a country builds their army to try and be the strongest. The A stands for alliances. That's almost like a friendship between countries. So it's when two countries agree to support each other during a war or two or more countries. Imperialism is when a country tries to take land abroad to build an empire. And nationalism is almost like an extreme patriotism. It's when you feel like your country is superior to other countries. You're the best and you might want to prove it. OK, so what I want you to do is I want you to split your double page in your exercise book or your A3 sheet into four like this. So you'll use a ruler and you'll make a line vertically and then a line horizontally to make four different um, sections on your page. If you're working on A4, it is possible to get all the information on A4, but you'll have to write really small. So I don't know if you want to just do, um, split each A4 sheet in half and just have two sections on each. Um, and then I want you to write in the following headings. I have done them in order, so I'm going to talk through militarism first, then imperialism, then alliances, and then nationalism. So I'm going to work like left to right. Mm -hmm. So that's the order I'm going to go in. So just make your page look like this. And then what you're going to do is you're going to fill each section in um, with notes. 
OK, so we're going to start with militarism. So first, I'm just going to give you a definition of what militarism is. And I want you to write that in your own words in the box that says militarism. You can bullet point it if you want to. So militarism is when a country builds up their army to be the strongest or builds up their military to be the strongest. Countries might want a strong military for defence. So, for example, Germany, who felt encircled by her enemies. Remember, encirclement, it's a key word. It's when Germany was sandwiched between Russia to the east and France to the west. And if there was a war, Germany was very aware that they would have to probably split their army and fight on two fronts, which would weaken the German army significantly because Russia is a very large country with a large army and France has a very well equipped army. Um, so Germany knew that they would be at a disadvantage if they had to do that. So they were building up their military um, to try and make sure that they were as strong as possible if this were to happen. Also, countries might use their militaries to conquer other countries and to build a large empire and to protect that empire once they had it. So Britain, for example, they would use their navy to protect the coastlines of other countries or to travel, uh, sorry, other countries that they owned or to travel to other countries and conquer them. Okay, so a country's military includes both its land army and also its navy, so its ships. And you need to know that the British Navy is called the Royal Navy and it was the best in the world. Britain felt immense pride in her navy and its glorification as the world's best fleet stretched back to the reign of Elizabeth I and the Spanish Armada. Britain would do anything to protect the Royal Navy. What we're going to try and do as well during this um, revision session, I forgot to mention it sooner, is I want you to try and identify some links between some of these causes because it's important that you know that these causes don't exist in isolation. You don't have militarism happening over here and then um, imperialism happening somewhere else and the two are completely isolated from each other. They do overlap and they do link. So the first link you should be able to identify is that militarism is really clearly linked to imperialism so you need a strong military to take over other countries and to protect your empire so if you want to you can do an arrow from militarism to imperialism and just explain that link or you can do it separately or you can write it as a bullet point in either box and you can maybe highlight it and color code it at the end if you want to the second link that you should be able to find is that militarism does link with nationalism because a country having a strong military might make them feel empowered and it might make them feel superior to other countries and it might make them want to prove that they are the best or empower them to want to go out and prove that they are superior and they are stronger than everybody else. And as we can see, Britain has that in immense pride and that um, a nationalistic feeling about their navy. So Germany was very envious of Britain's navy and in 19, sorry, 1898, the German Kaiser announced that he was going to build 41 battleships. This was the very first steps in the Kaiser building up the German navy, which was a prospect that made Britain very suspicious. The reason being is that Britain had a large empire and Britain was also an island. So Britain needed a strong navy. Uh, if they were attacked, it was likely that they were going to be attacked from the sea. So they needed a navy to defend themselves. But also their their empire was many miles away. So they had land in Asia. They had land in Africa. They needed to be able to travel to those lands and protect them. Germany didn't particularly have a big empire, nor did they, um, nor were they surrounded by water. They were surrounded by countries. They were almost landlocked. And then at the top, there was like a small coastline, but they didn't need this huge navy that they were building up. So Britain started to think, what are you doing? Why are you building it? What are you going to do with it? Are you going to try and invade other countries? Are you going to try and take our empire? So it created tension. Also, it's important to remember that the German Kaiser was the first cousin of the King of, of Britain and they, their shared grandmother was Queen Victoria. So the Kaiser had been to Britain several times and he'd seen the Royal Navy in all of its glory. He was actually uh, made an admiral of the British fleet and he always looked at the British Navy as something that was um, really prestigious and he wanted the German Navy to be the same. His mother was British and when he was a child, his mother always spoke about how backwards Germany was and how Britain was far superior. And the Kaiser really, really wanted to make Germany just as strong as Britain, if not stronger. 
Okay, the next thing I want you to write down is about the naval arms race and the dreadnought. So in 1906, the dreadnought was developed by British Admiral John Fisher. It was a new warship which was 585 feet long and had the capacity to carry a crew of 800 men. It had high caliber guns and was the fastest battleship of its day, reaching 21 knots at full speed. The unveiling of the dreadnought marks the beginning of the naval arms race, which is when Britain and Germany were competing for the strongest navy and the most dreadnoughts. Britain said that for every one dreadnought that Germany made, they would make two, meaning that Germany was never able to catch up. And by 1914 and the end of the arms race, the Germans had 17 dreadnoughts and the British had 29. The Germans switched to making U-boats, which are a kind of underwater submarine that could fire torpedoes and sink other ships. So if you have a look at the pictures there, you can see a picture of a dreadnought and also a picture of a German U-boat. So that's what they would have looked like. OK, so I would recommend that you get down some of that specific evidence. So you need the date 19, sorry, 1898 and that the Kaiser built 41 battleships. You need the date that the dreadnought was developed. You also need some of those statistics about the dreadnoughts, particularly the one that says the Germans had 17 and the British had 29 by the end of the arms race. OK, so now we're going to move on and we're going to talk about imperialism next. Um, so imperialism is when a country takes land abroad to build an empire. Countries want empires because they could claim the natural resources of a country. So things like oil or um, coal, um, but they could also claim the people as a resource as well. And they can become very wealthy. The way that they would do this is that they would take um, the people and sell them into slavery. Uh, or they would take um, the people in a country, the men in particular, and use them for their army. And a big empire can also give a country prestige and political influence. So because Britain had the biggest empire in the world, they had quite a lot of say in international affairs and particularly things that were going on in Asia and Africa, which is where Britain had the majority of their land. But I just want to go back to this link with militarism real quick. So we know that imperialism is linked with militarism because you need a strong military to take over a country. But another link is that when you take over that country, you can get um, money from exploiting their natural resources, which you can use then to fund your military and make your military even stronger. Or you can also take the men from their country and make them fight in your military. So again, it makes your military even stronger. So it's almost like a cycle. You need your military to get an empire, but having an empire can strengthen your military. And again, this idea of prestige, importance, influence leads to nationalism. A country with a large empire is likely to be proud of that empire. Therefore, um, they will think that they are perhaps superior. So since 1750, the British Empire had been the largest in the entire world. At its height, Britain owned over 100 colonies abroad or 25 percent of the globe. And it was said that the sun never set on the British Empire. So this is said because Britain owned land in the northern hemisphere. Obviously, we are located in the northern hemisphere and in the southern hemisphere. So Australia, for example. Uh, and when it's daytime here, it's nighttime there. And when it's nighttime there, it's daytime here. So they own so much of the globe that somewhere on the British Empire, the sun was always up. Uh, in 1897, the Kaiser announced something called Weltpolitik, and this is because he was always envious of the British Empire and he felt that he wanted Germany to be just as strong. He wanted to build the strength of Germany and Weltpolitik is it just means world policy and it is the plan to turn Germany into a global power by building the military and in turn building a large empire. So this is in 1897 and from our last slide you know that in 1898 he announced the building of those 41 battleships. So again there's a really strong link there so make sure you've got that term down Weltpolitik and that you understand what that means. The German foreign secretary at the time is quoted as saying, we wish to throw no one into the shade, but we also want our place in the sun. OK, so the scramble for Africa is an example of imperialism, and this is when countries in Europe tried to seize land in Africa 
for their empires. It's called a scramble because there's only so much land in Africa and everybody's trying to scramble to get it. Um, in 1870, only 10% of the land in Af Africa was owned and run by Europeans. However, by 1914, which isn't that long afterwards, it's 44 years later, 90% of the land in Africa was owned by Europeans. And this is the impact of the scramble for Africa. They did this to try and grow their power, their wealth and their influence, their prestige. Um, as we said before, everybody wants to build an empire. Everybody wants to be a global power. The larger countries with existing empires like France and Britain were involved, but also smaller, newer countries like Italy were involved um, and even Belgium uh, and obviously Germany as well. So this is this picture here, this source, which is a primary source. It's one that you could very much uh, you could very well see on an exam paper. It shows three countries. So it shows Germany, it shows Britain and it shows Russia all trying to grab land from the globe. And you can see on their bags, on their sacks, it says German grab bag or British grab bag. And they're grabbing the land and they're putting it into their bags. And you can see on the globe as well, the country that's emphasised there. You can see Asia over by the Russian um, man, but you can see Africa is the one that is the, the most emphasised because it, it does reflect that at the time people were taking the land from Africa. Okay, so this is one that I don't think, I'm going to give you two pieces of evidence for imperialism here that I do want you to write down, but I think that some of you don't always realise that this is imperialism, you just don't always make the links. Can we make sure that we are writing this down, that this is an example of imperialism, um, but also I'm going to do it uh, quite superficially here because I am going to do a separate lesson looking at these things um, in depth okay so this is going to be quite superficial but we will go in depth in um, the, the second revision session. Um, so the Moroccan crises are examples of imperialism so France remember wanted to take Morocco which is in Africa, North Africa for her empire the German Kaiser becomes involved in the situation and he shows support for Moroccan independence. And Britain is actually supporting France in their endeavour to take Morocco. So you've got Britain supporting France and Germany that's saying, no, Morocco should be independent. France shouldn't be allowed to take Morocco. Now, why does the Kaiser do this? The Kaiser does this for a couple of reasons. Firstly, he wants to prove that Germany is a world power and that they should be involved in international relations and they should be involved in things that are happening in Africa. He's intending to build an empire in Africa after all, so he wants to be involved in politics in that part of the world. Secondly, he wants to test France. He wants to see how far he can push them. He wants to see if they are likely to declare war on him uh, or on his country. And then finally, he also wants to test this alliance between Britain and France. The, uh, the Entente Cordiale um, had been signed in 1904 so there was kind of a loose alliance between Britain and France and he wanted to test just how strong this alliance is. So he goes to Morocco and he says Morocco should be able to remain independent, they shouldn't be taken over by France and there is an international conference the next year so this issue is discussed in 1906. The German Kaiser at this international conference is completely humiliated. Britain and France almost team up against him and every time he tries to talk he's silenced. The only country that defends him or supports him is Austria-Hungary. Even Italy, who is a part of the Triple Alliance, who is supposed to be allies with Germany, doesn't defend Germany at all. So the Kaiser leaves knowing two things. Firstly, he's humiliated um, and secondly, he knows uh, that this this um, alliance between Britain and France is really, really strong. And there is already an existing alliance between France and Russia. And he's right, because a year later, the Triple Entente is signed. So Britain, France and Russia are now in a formal alliance. And that happens in 1907. So make sure you write that down. And you can also see a link there, can't you, between imperialism and the politics that come with imperialism and alliances. Okay, and the last thing we're going to talk about with imperialism, if you need to pause this at any point, feel free to pause it, make some notes, replay certain parts if you need to, because I'm aware that I, sorry, I do talk quite fast, um, and then you can start playing it again when you, when you feel ready to move on. So the last thing we're going to talk about are problems in the Balkans. Now, again, we are going to talk about this quite superficially because I'm going to do a separate lesson. Revision lesson two is going to be on Morocco and the Balkans. So the Balkan Peninsula is an area um, 
it includes Greece, it includes Bosnia, it includes uh, Bulgaria, it includes Serbia, and it's the two large powers that are near to the Balkan Peninsula are Austria-Hungary and also Russia. The area of the Balkans used to be owned by the Ottoman Empire, the Turks. However, when the empire becomes weak, the Balkans rebelled and some areas become independent. Large countries nearby, so Austria, Hungary and Russia, take this opportunity to try and take land in the Balkans and Austria, Hungary actually annex um, the country of Bosnia. Russia and Serbia are really angry about this and they come to the defence of Bosnia um, because they are all Slavs and what this means is that they share a national identity. It's almost like an ethnicity of sorts. They feel that they are brothers. They feel they have the same blood, the same religion, the same languages and the same national identity and that is the Balkans crisis or the Bosnian crisis of 1908 to 1909. The competition for land also leads to the Balkan Wars, which happens between 1912 and 1913. Um, and that leads to growing feelings of nationalism in the area. So again, I am going to go over this in more depth um, in the second lesson, but you do need to understand that this is an example of imperialism because it's all about land, it's all about empires and who owns what land but it links really clearly to nationalism. It's important that you know this link as well between the Balkans and um, nationalism and what ends up happening with Serbia and the assassination. So because of this conflict and because of the Austrian-Hungarian Empire annexing Bosnia and the tension that resulted, a, 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 sorry, that happened as a result of that in Slavic countries, Serbia started to get this, um, get the motivation to create a country called Greater Serbia. Now, Greater Serbia would be a country in the Balkans, um, a united Slav nation. So that would include Bosnia and they would be one country. The problem is that Austria-Hungary currently owns owned Bosnia. So Serbia and Bosnia want to break free from Austro-Hungarian rule and they want to create their own country called Greater Serbia, if that makes sense. And you start to get these nationalist groups forming in the area that want to get rid of Austria-Hungary. Um, so that's how it links to nationalism. Countries that are oppressed or countries that are owned by empires, they often feel very nationalistic and feel like they really want to break free from that empire. And it leads to, um, it, it can lead to rebellion. Okay, so we're going to move on to alliances. Alliances is probably the easiest one to understand. So an alliance, as I said before, is almost like a friendship between countries. One country agrees to protect another country in a time of war, or several countries could agree to protect each other in a time of war. There were two main alliances before the First World War. The first one is the Triple Alliance. This is the first alliance that was signed, and initially it's kept a secret, and it's signed in 1882 because Germany was threatened by the prospect of encirclement. It contained Austria, Hungary and Germany who were old allies anyway and Italy. Now again you need to understand um, that term encirclement. We did talk about it at the beginning. It's when Germany feels threatened because they are surrounded by their allies. So they've got Russia to the east and France to the west. The Triple Entente containing France, Russia and Britain was completed in 1907 after the first Moroccan crisis, although France and Russia had already been allies for several years. The alliance was formed as a response to the growing power of Germany uh, and countries felt threatened and suspicious. So obviously that was exasperated and made evident in the Moroccan crisis. And that's why um, a year after that international conference, the Triple Entente is formalised. So by 1907, two alliances had been signed and it meant that firstly, Europe was literally split into two alliances. It was almost like a bomb waiting to go off or uh, there, there just needed to be some kind of spark to, to light this fire, but everything was already there. Everything was already 
building up. It also meant that if there was a small dispute between two countries, their allies would become involved in order to support them. So this is what we see with Austria, Hungary and Serbia. That's war that really should have been just between the two countries that we probably wouldn't be learning about now became into the first, it turned into the first ever world war because of this alliance system. This is how a small conflict turns into a world war. And the alliance system, it's important that you know this, it changed the nature of international warfare forever. It's, this is why this war is called the First World War, because it's the first one of its kind. It's the first one that involves most of the, the global, the big global powers. And then you can see a source there that shows, um, that depicts the, the signing of the Triple Entente. Okay, and finally, we're just going to talk about nationalism. So nationalism People find this the hardest one to understand, but it's really, really quite simple. So nationalism is almost like an extreme patriotism. So it's when you feel extreme pride in your country. It's when a country feels as though they are superior and the other countries are inferior. It's often linked to xenophobia as well, because uh, often um, people from a country that has nationalistic and a national a nationalistic identity or nationalistic views would feel as though their people are superior to other people and this can often lead to people taking some extreme actions and it can be linked to the concept of martyrdom so it's important that you understand what martyrdom is or what a martyr is this is when someone is willing to die for something they believe in or become a hero for a specific cause for example we see that with Gavrilo Princip who kills the Archduke Franz Ferdinand and he knows he's going to die as a result um, but he does it because he wants to be a martyr or a hero for Serbia so evidence of nationalism includes the German national anthem of 1914, which had the lyrics Germany, Germany, above all, above all in the world. This illustrates the national pride that Germans felt at the time and portrays a strong and powerful image to other countries. And also this is a link that, that people often don't make, but the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand is an example of nationalism. It's an example of Serb nationalism. Um, so this is when Franz Ferdinand, the Archduke of Austria-Hungary, so he's next in line to the throne. He's not the leader of Austria-Hungary yet, but he's going to be when his uncle Franz Joseph died. Um, and he's assassinated by a nationalist group called the Black Hand Gang, which formed in Serbia um, around the time or just after of the Bosnian crisis, as a result of the Bosnian crisis and the Balkan Wars. Um, and it included journalists, military officials and lawyers and was actually sponsored by the Serbian government. They wanted independence from Austrian, the Austrian-Hungarian Empire and wanted to create one united Slav nation called Greater Serbia. So remember, that's when countries that are Slav, like Bosnia and Serbia, unite to make one country and they are independent. They rule themselves. They're not owned by an empire. In June 1914, they recruited seven students who travelled to Sarajevo in Bosnia to kill Franz Ferdinand. One of the members of this group was a nationalist Bosnian Serb called Gavrilo Princip. Princip is 19 years old. He's very young. He's dying of tuberculosis. He knows he's going to die anyway, so he feels he might as well die a martyr. He might as well die fighting for something he really believes in, such as um, the end of the Austrian-Hungarian oppression of his country Serbia and Bosnia um, and this idea of greater Serbia. He shot Franz Ferdinand in the neck while he was travelling in an open top car with his pregnant wife Sophie. Franz Ferdinand had decided to travel in an open top car to show the Bosnian Serbs that he was friendly and that he wanted to forge a better relationship than his uncle Franz Joseph had. The Austrian-Hungarian Empire blamed Serbia which you know, Serbia was behind it. One of the assassins actually confessed and that's how they got the information. Um, and this was the start of the July crisis when they gave Serbia an ultimatum. Serbia needed to let Austrian-Hungarian police enter the country to get rid of these nationalist groups, but Serbia refused to do that and Austria-Hungary declared war. This triggers the alliance system because Russia comes to Serbia's aid Germany comes to Austria-Hungary's aid and asked, asks Russia to leave Austria-Hungary alone. Then Germany declares war on Russia when they refuse to do that so and starts moving their army towards Russia's ally France. And then um, Britain becomes involved during the Schlieffen plan, which again we'll look at in another lesson. But it's important that you know that nationalism, 
Serb nationalism, which is linked to imperialism, leads to the assassination, which which triggers the alliance system, which starts the war. So you can see how everything is all interlinked. As I said before, it's not um, nothing exists in isolation. There are links everywhere. So finally, we're just going to look at how all of this leads to war. So militarism, imperialism and nationalism can be quite provocative. It can make other countries feel suspicious and can cause a lot of tension. For example, militarism. If a country next to you is building a huge army, then you are going to wonder why they are doing that. Maybe you will also start building your own army to defend yourself. Also, once all the countries in Europe have done that, they're ready to go. If something happens that maybe wouldn't have resulted in a war before or might have resulted in a short conflict, it can turn into a much bigger deal because everybody is so well armed. And at the time, people had spent millions of pounds, different countries had spent millions and millions, equivalent to billions in today's money on building their army. So everybody was ready to go and they were willing to sustain this war that ended up lasting four years. Imperialism can also lead to jealousy and competition because all countries are competing for a limited amount of land and might disagree about who should own what, like we see with the Moroccan crisis. And then nationalism. If you are nationalistic about your country and you are willing to die for a specific cause, it can lead to extreme actions against another country, for example, the assassination. So all of these things, it's important that you know, are building suspicion, they're building tension, they're building competition. The assassination was the spark that in ignited the First World War. When Prince ships shot Franz Ferdinand in June 1914, Austria-Hungary declared war on Serbia, Russia came to Serbia's aid because they were both Slavs, Germany came to the aid of Austria-Hungary and told Russia to leave them alone. When Russia refused, Germany moved towards France and then the alliance system was triggered. And as I said, because of years and years of militarism, all of these countries were prepared to fight. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, and then this source actually depicts it quite nicely. So it depicts the triggering of the alliance system quite well. Again, this is a source that you could get on a GCSE paper. So if we go from left to right on the screen, so the small guy at the front that says, if you touch me, I'll, um, that is Serbia. Uh, the second one along uh, that says, if you make a move, I'll, that's Austria-Hungary. Then the guy behind him that says, if you hit that little fella, I'll, that's Russia. Then behind him is Germany, if you strike my friend, I'll. Then France, if you hit him, I'll. And then at the end, ho there, if you chaps, uh, that's Britain. Um, so yeah, and obviously Britain's joining a bit later because they join after the failure of the Schlie or during the failure of the Schlieffen plan. Um, so yeah, that's quite a nice source. It shows you how the alliance system is triggered and how it's almost like a domino effect or a chain reaction. Okay, so I've got two tasks that I want you to do. Hopefully you have managed to get your um, double page spread full of information, including dates, including events, specific evidence, explanations of what each cause is and how it led to war. Um, I want you to draw a timeline of all, using that information you've got, I want you to draw a timeline of all the events leading up to World War One using the information from this lesson. I need you to include the following events. So I need you to include the scramble for Africa, Weltpolitik, the arms race, including the Kaiser's announcement to build 41 battleships in 1898 and the creation of the Dreadnought in 1906, the two Moroccan crises, um, the International Conference, the Balkans crises, sorry, I didn't put the dates in there, that's 1908 to 1909. Also the Balkan Wars, um, 1912 and 1913. Uh, the signing of the two alliances, so 1882 and 1907, and also the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand. What we need to do is just draw the timeline, add these events on with the correct dates, and I want you to do a short explanation of each one. So maybe a sentence or two about what each one was. So for example, the scramble for Africa, when all the countries in Europe were trying to get land in Africa for their empires um, and then uh, you can make it into a poster if you want to or you can just stick the timeline up onto your wall you can dual code it with little pictures and things that will help you remember it and it'll be a really really good revision tool when you are trying to remember those dates uh, just before your exam 
And then finally, what I want you to do is I want you to make sure that you understand all of these key terms and I want you to write your own definition for each one. Do not copy and paste it because you need to understand them and be able to use them properly. Um, so you've got militarism, alliances, imperialism, nationalism, the naval arms race, the scramble for Africa, Weltpolitik, the Archduke Franz Ferdinand, Martyr or martyrdom, Kaiser Wilhelm, the Black Hand Gang, Dreadnought and U-Boat. Um, and that is your revision homework. Hopefully this all made sense. If you have any questions about anything, you can pop up in chat on Teams or you can email me or your class teacher and we'll be happy to explain anything that you do not understand. Um, the next revision lesson following on from this will be about Morocco and the Balkans and we'll go in a bit more depth um, about those two and how they led to the war as well. Thank you. Bye.